Good evening, everybody. Welcome to School Psych Podcast. So glad to have you here tonight. We're going to be chatting about uh, report writing, which is, of course, a big a big component, whether we like it or hate it, uh, of our jobs here as school psychologists. You know, we, we, we have kind of our schedule with our guests coming out, and, and once in a while, we, you know, just scheduling doesn't allow for um, us to, to put a guest in a, in a certain slot. And so we usually have a discussion of, you know, do we want to take the night off and just kind of chill, or do we want to just the three of us come and have an informal conversation? And so we felt like, yeah, let's have an informal conversation tonight. And uh, Rebecca, as many of you know, is, is back in school, and so she's, you know, in the midst of, of, of seeing kind of report vignettes in action and all these things. And so we've been having conversations about that. Um, you know, we all have done, you know, a lot of evaluations and things and, and just talking about how early year, early career school psychologists and how we're trained to write reports and how kind of that evolves over time and what we've learned and, and all this stuff. So I think it's going to be a fun conversation. So thank you so much for joining us. But um, I'm Rachel. I'm a school psychologist in Maryland. I'm going to pass it over to Rebecca, who's going to talk about how you can participate live tonight. Rebecca. Hello, everybody. I'm Rebecca. I'm a school psychologist in Florida and a psychology trainee in a clinical psychology program. So I'm excited to share that um, unique maybe perspective with you all tonight. And I'm excited to hear about what's on your mind. I did an informal search for report writing on uh, on the internet today and on YouTube and um, Instagram. There's lots of school psychologists actually that are talking about report writing and how to write a report. And there's lots of graduate students and early career folks, um, especially with some really great questions. So I, I hope that you are um, logged in. And if you're joining us live, you can comment right alongside the YouTube video. And even if you're watching the video later in time, please do feel free to comment because it links up right to the time um, that you would have been um, chiming in if had you been watching live. And we can go back and look at that comments and uh, those comments and continue the conversation over time. You can also feel free to message us. We get lots of great message messages from school psychologists across the country on Facebook, on the School Psyched podcast page, our dedicated podcast page on Facebook, and on my Facebook page, um, school psyched, your school psychologist. Also, we're still hanging in there on Twitter for now. So if you'd like to tweet at us, um, please feel free to tweet at podcast site is our uh, podcast handle. And you can use the hashtag psyched podcast. And I'll be looking for notifications as we go. And we can all see the comments as they pop up if you're tuning in uh, live with us tonight. And I'm going to hand it over to Eric to introduce himself and then we'll get started. Hi, Eric. Hi, Rebecca and Rachel, and uh, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm excited just for the three of us to have a conversation with you all, right? So um, our guests are us, all of us uh, this evening. So the wonderful school psych and educational community and administrators, whoever else, uh, parents who might be listening. Um, this is our opportunity to have a discussion. And part of this discussion or, or where we think this discussion will go, um, stemmed from some conversations, as as Rachel mentioned, uh, reading some support uh, reports and talking to one another about what do you think about this? And, and so this past week, especially, uh, one came across my desk that was sort of, I would say, disappointing to me. And, uh, you know, not that we all don't have days where we don't write our best, or, you know, we all have days where we go, mm, that report wasn't maybe my best work, or I got everything out that I needed to get out, but I'm under time constraints and, and perhaps I could have said it better, or, you know, perhaps there wasn't time or somebody finds mistakes, uh, corrections, typos, that kind of thing in your report. And we all have that. And we all feel uh, maybe frustrated and stressed by that. Um, but the, the report that I read, not from somebody in my district, in fact, it was uh, from uh, out of state, um, it came across my desk and it did not paint a picture of the child, the same child that, um, so, oh, awesome. <laughs> we have yeah. guests chiming in already. Awesome. Uh, yeah. it, it didn't really paint a picture of the child as the child was presenting. And so it dawned on me, like, you know, we may be in school districts that where certain evaluation tools are required or certain things are required in reports, 
how do we navigate that? How do we get everything in the assessment that needs to be in the assessment? What are we even assessing for? And then how do we put it down on paper? So that's sort of where this uh, conversation kind of started this week. And when we were dealing with guest scheduling issues, we thought this would be great for us just to have a conversation about this and see what you all think. Um, I think so it's I, such an important topic. And I just want um, yeah. to talk a little bit about um, my recent fall assessment class. I, because of APA requirements, any course that has not been taken in the past six years needs to be retaken in an APA accredited program. So I had to take cognitive assessment. And it's, it was very interesting to me that, um, you know, I, I'm lucky to have sort of a like that beginner's mind as a Buddhist might say, you know, like I really try to approach things, everything like I have something to learn because it's true. I always have something to learn. And report writing and assessment was never a, a huge part of my role um, as a school psychologist in a private school. But um, it was interesting to see, to kind of watch the progress of um, my colleagues, my peers in class who had, were, you know, not familiar with assessment. So we read Sattler, the, the newer edition, um, revised editions of the two Sattler books. And we practiced giving assessments to volunteer, you know, all the things that you all, if you're school psychologists, remember doing. But what I noticed about um, my peers who had, had never done it before is that it's so stressful, first of all, because it's a lot to wrap your mind around. The statistics, like well, what do these tests measure? What do the subtests measure? What do they, what does, what do these results mean? How do you, what is the administration about? Like what, you know, there's so much to learn in that one class that when it comes to report writing, all of that is still churning, right? Okay. So now you have these numbers, you have to look at these tables. And what I think sometimes happens to school psychologists, as we get a handle on all of those things, we start leaning on the strategies that make it easier. And then because it stops being so confusing, it's easier just to just do it the way we've always done it, whether that be like a a template that you get from your, maybe your supervisor or, you know, something that like, or depending on the referral question, if if the referral question is X, then my report reads like Y, you know, and and I think, Eric, what you're talking about, sometimes we come across these reports and you're like, what is the point of that? What what do I get from this that I couldn't get from like just the table of scores? Right. And that's so sad because it's so not useful and it's so not reader friendly. And um, so just maybe in defense of early career school psychologists and early career psychologists writing reports, it's really hard to move from that, oh my gosh, I, I got it. And so I've got this format and I say this in the first paragraph and I say this in the second. And then, but it's, it's, it's like important, I think, to start that way kind of, but then um, helpful to kind of grow from it, if that makes sense. I don't know if I'm making sense, but I had such, I think, compassion <laughs> for my colleagues in class because it's it's a really it's like the bulk of what we do um it's a few classes in graduate school and then it's like trial by fire you know when you get to internship and after beyond you know everybody i'm sure i'd love to hear from some of you out there who are watching what are, what are your referrals like like how many you know <laughs> reports do you write a week or how many referrals do you get a month because I can imagine it's not like going to be you know, some nice warm fuzzy numbers <laughs> that feel really good. And I'll say that what goes into my report is sometimes impacted by how much time I happen to have in that moment in that week. How many do how many deadlines I have, right? So um, if I've got a whole bunch of reports, um, then I'm definitely. I, I wouldn't say cutting corners because I don't I don't think it's that I think that normally when when given infinite time or I don't have too much going on I kind of indulge in these longer reports where I include like every little detail I'm making beautiful graphs I'm like I'm having fun with it because I'm one that does like report writing 
Um, and, and I kind of yell at myself sometimes because I go over the top. Like I definitely, you know, you know, nobody needs to know all these little details and nobody's read, let's, let's face it. So many people do not read, actually sit down and read our reports. Um, and so I kind of yell at myself and stop putting everything in. And even when I have interns and practicum students, I'm like, don't do what I'm doing. Like I'm trying to stop. Um, but yeah, I think that you could like tell how busy a week it was based on like how long a <laughs> report is and how much and how pretty it is, if that makes sense. <laughs> which is, I don't know. Yeah, for sure. And, and I also notice from this class that because we're still learning about what these tests measure, what, what each subtest kind of means, how is one subtest in an index different from the other? You know, Sattler clearly says that the, the most important number is the full scale. And after that, we can talk about the indices, but really we shouldn't be making, you know, interpretations on um, difference within the index. But yet in class, we're really encouraged to do that because it helps us understand. And then it feels kind of cool when you're like, oh, I get it. I get the difference between, you know, um, these two subtests and I'm gonna explain it. I'm gonna explain this vignette um, such that people understand why he got a five on this one and an eight on this one. And it's like, it's useless, but it feels good because you feel really smart. And then you pull these like uh, sentences from for your template from these really good reports. And you're like, oh, that sounds awesome. That sounds like someone will be like, wow, this psychologist knows what she's talking about. And I, it's really tempting, I think, to over and not I'm not saying, Rachel, that's what you do, because I know that's not what you do. But but I'm saying that it is something that I think is easily easily done by people who are, are learning because it feels good. And and also it speaks to the course, like the like what the professor is looking for because no one like in class we learn one test at a time and we report we write a report on one test there's not that much to say if it was like a real life thing when i was just giving this cognitive test my report might be like a page but for class we have to analyze all 21 you know sub so like it's 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 kind of messy and um it's easier I, I think it would be easy to get stuck in that grad school way of looking at things because it protects our ego. It feels like, oh, the professor would love this. Look how I analyze that. Um, it's just not realistic. So I wonder what you all think about the difference between our training programs and then real life assessment and report writing. And when you said about, you know, oh, the, the, the professor kind of, you know, critiquing and if they're going to like this. And that reminded, I saw a comment on Facebook, but there was a discussion along those lines about, you know, oh, I feel the need. Somebody was complaining. I feel the need to put everything in there. And people are talking about, yeah, like, I feel that need, too. I picture this old professor, like, looking over my shoulder, like, make sure it's all, you know, very defensible, very accurate, very... And, you know, sometimes that can be a little bit too much. But yeah, I think that sometimes we try and put on, you know, we try and meet expectations that um, maybe we think come, you know, from the professor from grad school. And I, I have found that, I, you know, I think back to the first reports that I wrote in grad school, it was very much like a cut and paste story, you know, there's blanks here and this score is in the blank range and this means this and and you just kind of you would fill in the blanks it was a fill in the blanks kind of mad libs type of report and um that's all i really knew how to do because it is hard i totally agree with you rebecca like that that is hard to you're doing so many different things at once i think when you're starting off um as a school psychologist and there's so much to think about and so you're just yeah, my, my reports were just fill in the blank and a little blurb here and a little blurb there. And I was very unsure. And um, so I think that we learn all the other stuff as we go and we kind of maybe overcompensate in some cases. And it's, uh, 
I look back at past reports and I'm like, whoa, what was I thinking? And I, so I, and I, I'm sure that I'll look back at the reports that I'm writing now and think the same thing in another five years because it's just constantly changing and I'm learning and doing different things. But Eric, I know you like write a lot of reports um, for your district, so I'm, I'm curious in your perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, great thoughts too. I, I think it's easy to get lost in the minutia of the tests, right? And, and to try to interpret everything. And I think... Well, I have a couple of thoughts. It's also easy to overtest, right? Um, not that we have time to do that, but um, I have seen reports and and you know been asked by interns like, um, what do I do when I give? And they you know list out you know eight rating scales and two cognitives, and you're like, wait a second, you know the the likelihood of getting false positive information increases when you start doing those kinds of things, right? We're we're over assessing, um, and so. I think, it, you know, starting with a referral question. So I'm going to try to share this little PowerPoint. Um, and let's see, you know, usually I'm always at the other end of this. So I'm like, do I hit the present button? And let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, so Erica was had some forethought and, and put some things in a PowerPoint. So look at how organized we all look. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's get it up. All right. Let's see. Can you see my slides? Yep. All right. So uh, assessment and report considerations. My thought is, um, you know, our, our reports come from the assessment, right? It's it, we data collect and we try to write a report um, to inform our decision making process. And so as I was thinking about this, because I, I have been talking to my interns about this uh, most recently, and we started to create a sort of an assessment process guide. Um, like, what do we do when we get a referral? <laughs> you know, it's from start to finish, from the assessment end, not the IEP end and the meeting end. But um, where do we start with that? And so uh, I started by thinking about why do we assess? You know, in education, uh, assessment drives instruction, it drives intervention, um, it informs students of their progress and thus can drive their end of learning. Um, it informs our teaching practice and our curriculum and our instructional methodologies. In psychology, we assess to better understand people's strengths and weaknesses, um, to help identify areas of emotional, behavioral, and personal need, and to make treatment recommendations. So we put that together for school psychology. We always have the entitlement or classification decision and then understanding a student's strengths, skills, weaknesses. We plan interventions and we evaluate outcomes, right? So those are sort of our, our purposes for assessment in school psychology. And if other people have thoughts, I don't want to the PowerPoint is very short, which I can just go through, but Rachel and Rebecca, I can't see you while I'm presenting. So please feel free to, um, you know, stop and talk. Or if people have thoughts or questions as we go, um, I'm happy to, uh, to pause for a second while I'm, I'm going through this. Um, I have some things that I encourage my interns and practicum students with. Um, just things to consider when we're assessing and when we're report writing. Um, tests don't give us a yes or no or binary answer as to whether or not a child has a disability or qualifies for special ed. They provide data to help us make a decision. And, and so that's one of the things sometimes when I'm reading on social media, threads that say, here are some test scores, what do you think? And we we typically have lively discussions, but you'll the discussions will range from, yes, the kid has X or Y disability, they qualify for X, Y, Z, to the tests don't make that decision. You can only get so much data from the test. So, um, you know, so as we think about our assessments, um, think that the data provides information for us to help make informed decisions. Um, I think about questions, uh, functional questions, why is behavior happening? Clinical questions, is there a diagnosis? Um, I also 
I, I wish I had thought ahead to put in my Guy Fieri picture here. Um, when I'm doing this kind of a presentation somewhere, uh, I have a picture of Guy Fieri with his Triple D television show, um, Diners, Drive -ins, Dr Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives. And I'll put that here because we're trying to determine the difference between a delay, a disorder or a disability. Um, and so, you know, when we have, everybody has, a, or a delay, a deficit and a disability, I, I also sometimes put, you know, every student who's being referred has some sort of academic delay. They may have a skill deficit and they may have a disorder or a disability. And so as we are assessing, we want to ask the educational question, what, you know, what's the impact uh, on that child's functioning in school, given what they have going on with them. So um, through many of our podcast guests, we have learned, you know, that we need to know our tests, um, what they do and how to interpret them. Um, we've talked to a number of guests that remind us that even full scale IQ only accounts for a certain percentage of a child's variance in achievement. So um, 50 to 60 percent of the variance. So we need to see if we can uncover what the other variables are. And so those are typically exclusionary criteria in some of our state uh, requirements for special education. Um, and so also sometimes when we're learning to interpret tests, um, we're taught in various methodologies and your state will require you to use a discrepancy method, a pattern of strengths and weaknesses method, um, or an RTI method. Uh, or some combination thereof, which are all vastly different. Um, but sometimes we're taught to interpret the IQ and to interpret it that it must correlate with a particular uh, strength or weakness on the achievement test. And I think that can be a red herring because we can't always find causation when we're doing um, cogn cognitive measures only. So just some things to consider. Um, always follow your state guidelines, of course, and um, if they're different than what you think best practice is, then we want to see how we can affect change um, for our state to adopt best practices. Um, other things, you know, rating scales are notoriously unreliable. Uh, they're great for gathering data and helping us quantify people's observations um, and to guide treatment and maybe progress monitor. But of course, we want to be careful not to use them as the sole basis for decision making. Um, and gather the data that you need to answer the referral questions. And so I think, you know, when we're doing an assessment, we want to start with why. We want to start with a good referral question. Why are we assessing this child? And then ask what? What are we looking for? What data do we need? Um, and I really, yeah, go ahead. I was just to say, yes, I think that's so important. And I see that um, lacking in so many evaluations. I mean, it helps me tremendously to know what I'm looking for. You know, so I always, that's like the first sentence or two of my report is reason for referral. And it's, you know, team suspects X and X disability. So I'm gathering information on that. Or, you know, we want to see if they qualify for this type of classroom that maybe has certain cut scores, or we're gathering information for present levels to construct a goal or write a counseling goal or something along those lines. But I, I try and be very clear about what specifically, you know, we're testing for. And I don't see that a whole lot in some of the other reports that come my way. And it always kind of frustrates me because um, I think my district has like a drop down that you can just, you know, select a thing. And it's usually like we're gathering information on how your student learns. And it's like, so it's very general. To me, that's not super helpful, but everybody uses that drop down. Whereas I make a point to kind of go in and, and not use the drop down and actually write it out what specifically I'm doing, what the scope of my evaluation is. That way I'm not going down rabbit holes and I'm sure to answer the questions that I'm setting out to answer. So yeah, it's important. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wonder just to tag onto that a little, are some of the referrals, um, do they sometimes seem like the question is, we have all, we just, we just don't know <laughs> what's going on. Something's wrong, you know, probably a processing, you know, we always joke about that. It's probably a processing disorder, a processing problem. But um, I wonder if, if everyone out there finds that often that the referrals are kind of vague and it's hard to even understand 
how the team got to that place. And there's a lot of pressure because it seems to me that sometimes um, the, the questions that the team, the school team has about a student or the parents or whomever, um, their perception is that their question can be answered with the evaluation process and the report. And that the report is actually the thing that they need, not qualification, not intervention. And so I think there's that confusion and that pressure, especially if you're early career or if you're new in your district or your role, that pressure is hard to sort of drill into to say, let's get this referral question right. What, what's the, you know, how has the RTI process been? What, where's the data that brought, that gets you here? So can either of you kind of speak to that a little bit? How do you handle that? And does that happen or am I making that up? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I don't know if you want to jump in, Rachel. I, I think the next slide might talk about some of that as well. Yeah, I know. I think, Rebecca, you hit the nail on the head where lots yeah. of people just think that getting a psychological evaluation or a neuropsych right. evaluation or something is going to solve the problem in itself. And it just doesn't. Or they have just unrealistic expectations of what this report is going to result in. And I've had hard conversations at the IP table where I've had an advocate say, well, I'll just do a cognitive because I want to see how he learns. And I had to speak up and say, well, that's not really going to tell you how he learns. Like, you need to understand kind of the limitations. I don't want to promise something that I can't deliver on. I'm not going to be able to tell you how he learns. And that was met with a lot of, you know, like, what do you mean? Of course, it tells us exactly how it le how he learns. And, you know, so I totally see that this whole processing thing, this vague, you know, there's a processing problem. And when teachers and one just told me the other day, and they all mean well, but I say that when you say there's a processing problem, that's such a broad term, you might as well be saying there's a thinking problem. This child has a thinking problem. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> it just, there's so many different types of processing, yeah. of thinking, of, you know, everything you can't, and, and these type of tests that we give are behavioral tests. They're not, you know, we're not hooking a kid up to an MRI or an EG or anything of that nature to know how the brain is, it's all behavioral. And so we can make some assumptions from that. But I think that, yeah, we need to kind of be careful. And I hate that whole fishing expedition of there's something wrong. And so we need to find it. And so I, that early on in my career, I came up a lot. Right now, I've been at my schools for a good amount of time that the team knows that before the meeting even starts, I'm kind of like, okay, what are what are we looking for? What are you thinking? What's going on? It's not just a, and my district's good too, that we have check boxes that you have to check out the disabilities that you suspect. So I, you know, we have to check those check boxes. So they can't just say, we're testing for disabilities. Um, sometimes they do want to check a lot more disabilities than I think need to be checked. And I try to work with them to kind of hone that and um, be more specific and say, well, if you're thinking this, then this other thing is probably not going to pan out. But yeah, no, I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great point. Like, it's not, you know, when a child is not learning or struggling to learn, the ideology of that can be anything, right? It could be trauma. It could be uh, the effects of poverty. It could be abuse. It could be lack of instruction. It could be uh, attendance. It could be so many variables outside the child, right? But we're testing variables that are internal to the child. We're assuming that the problem lies within the child. And so we're trying to see what's wrong, you know, with the child in a sense, um, which is really that old fashioned medical model, right? We're trying to figure out what's wrong rather than trying to put our heads together as a problem solving team to determine what's going on with Tommy's reading. You know, and it could be that we've had the worst reading curriculum, you know, and that nobody in our, you know, uh, country knew how to teach the science of reading for 20 years. Um, and it, it took uh, some research and a whole bunch of other things to turn around our instructional process. So how many children were identified in the 80s and 90s as having learning disabilities who perhaps were curriculum impaired, you know, and, and instructionally impaired? You know, I don't know. But um, yeah, so there's so many variables that, that impact that. And I think it, it really is important to us to sort of have a good referral question and try to uncover 
all of the pieces of the puzzle, um, not just is something wrong with Tommy or something. Right. And and Sue makes a, a really good point that I that I've seen a lot because in private schools we do get a lot of private clinician evaluations. And they're so different because one, I think because their aim is different. Um, and Eric, you and I kind of talked about developing a learning profile, right? <laughs> and I think that a lot of private reports have that flavor, like this is how your child learns. Um, and that's sort of, it's vague and it's a little ambiguous and it's not, it's not really what school psychologists, that's not, we're not using an assessment in itself or an evaluation to discover how your child learns, not sort of just the testing pieces. And I think you get these private reports and they're interpreting the tests as that. So it's, it's mm. very confusing. And it's especially, I think, probably the parents who often spend a lot of money on those reports. So yeah, having some way to talk about that to parents, I think is really important. And a lot of times I think we, we because our audience is, is the parent or guardian, um, we can make sure that our reports are readable that explain ideas like that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, th this is what this says. This doesn't say that your child learns in this particular mode, <laughs> you know, modality or uh, because, yeah. So I just wanted to. Yeah. And I think, I feel like we're better suited to ask, to answer the question, not, not of how your child learns, because honestly, we know that there's more similarities between students and human learning in general than, than differences. I know we all want to believe that everyone's a unique snowflake and we all learn so differently that we can't possibly like teach one child and teach a second child in the same manner. Um, but kind of the, the question of, but what, what do they need to learn? Like, what do they need to focus on? What's the missing skill? Um, maybe what the strengths are to leverage those strengths. And then using evidence-based practices to teach that missing skill, you know? And, and so finding those academic holes, I think is so much more than, you know, all oh, their working memory. And, you know, we've done so many podcasts on, on kind of the pitfalls of, of measuring these cognitive uh, constructs um, and, and how that doesn't translate into better instruction or better intervention and, and all those things that, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I've tried to, tried to change that around is we're not answering how they learn we're asking like what answering what do they need to learn um and then let's give them that that prescription for that evidence-based instruction that is most effective with the most amount of kids uh, until we find well, what fits <laughs> exactly yeah uh, it's funny my my current practicum student says the evaluation is not your intervention and i just love that uh I can't take credit for it. So, <laughs> but um, because oftentimes we get, you know, let's do some more testing. And because of my role, you know, I, I think, and I, it's not to devalue what I do, but um, around my district, people think, oh, we should have Eric assess the child um, because he's got a good lens. All of our school psychologists have a great lens. Um, mine's nothing special. I'm just trained in a, maybe some additional testing, um, perhaps that, you know, some folks may not have. Um, worked on or studied. Um, but the evaluation is not the intervention. That's not the answer. So yeah, really good thought. So framing with that good referral question is huge. And and perhaps, you know, we can keep the conversation going with folks like what are good referral questions? What are, you know, the, the referral question of does Tommy have a disability? Is, that's one piece of a referral, but that's not a good referral question. Um, you know, what are the variables that are impacting, you know, Tommy's learning? Um, what kinds of things might be interfering? What does Tommy need to be successful in school? Um, we can assess a lot of those variables <clears throat> in our evaluation. And so I think, um, you know, evidence-based medicine has a five-step process for um, evidence-based approaches. And this came out of, you know, the, the, mid nineties when evidence-based medicine was, was coming along. And um, Eric Youngstrom has a great article on applying evidence-based processes to clinical psychology or, or psychology as a whole. And I think we can take that same methodology to school psychology. And so the five steps um, from evidence 
based are framing clear questions, gathering relevant data, looking at research, designing a testing plan, and then answering the question. So if we apply that to school psychology, starting with our referral question, right? What are we testing? Why are we testing? What are we looking for? Um, gathering relevant information. So all, the RTI question, you know, what kind of intervention have they had? Um, getting observations, um, interviews, any records that might uh, tell us more about the child. So I think of the acronym RIOT, um, records, interviews, observation, and testing, all sources of data can help us frame where we are with the child. And then relevant research, instructional data, um, response to intervention, uh, behavioral supports, anything that might <clears throat> give us some insight into what's going on with the child. And then developing a comprehensive plan. What is a comprehensive eval? We're assessing in all areas of suspected disability, um, but it doesn't mean that every time I'm seeing a child, I have to test for autism, learning disability, behavior disorders. You know, if, if we're not suspecting any of that and the child's behavior presents and, and their classroom performance presents that they don't have those issues, then we don't need to test everything. I don't need to give every child an ADOS when I'm assessing. You know, I don't need to necessarily give every child a WISC when I'm assessing. Um, I'm going to choose the assessment tools that would uh, provide the most data to inform the, the referral question. So I like to think that when we give an assessment, we're trying to measure how the child thinks, what they know, and what they can do as it relates to academic skills and performance. Um, and so whoops, the last part of that is we're looking at treatment utility beyond the does the child qualify question. We want to answer how does the assessment lead us to develop a clear plan to support the student and perhaps measure their progress. And so that leads to clear um, IEP goals if they need an IEP or clear goals if they need support in some way. And so that sort of brings us to report writing. We've we've talked a lot um, recently about identifying students' strengths and hacking deficit thinking. In fact, when we had uh, doctors McClure and Reed on, um, I recently went to a really good workshop with one of our uh, previous guests, Dr. Charles Barrett, talking about strength-based assessments as well. Um, and so, you know, framing that in our report is really important. What does this child bring to the educational system, to the classroom, to this testing room um, that's valued? And how can I reflect that to the parents and teacher? Uh, I think that's crucial. And then what information do we need to share that accurate, accurately portrays how the child thinks, what they know, and what they can do? Um, and so uh, referencing that report that I mentioned in the beginning that really didn't paint the picture of the child's performance and, and functioning very well, um, you know, we want to be able to do that as best we can in our report writing. How do we... Um, you know, the last sentence here on, on the slide is exactly what Rachel and Rebecca were saying. You know, we use phrases like learning profile or learning portrait. And I'm not even sure we know what that means, right? I know, um, you know, when somebody wants to know how a student learns, exactly what you said, Rachel, um, we don't do learning styles. So, so what are they looking for? Um, learning styles has been debunked um, a long time ago. And, and so wondering what those terms mean and if we use them can we define them um so you know also we've used terms i know in the past probably more than currently child's potential or learning potential and what does that mean you know i, I think we have to know what some of that means before we throw those into reports and we also use phrases like interpret with caution we use validity statements um and i think it's important if we're going to use those kinds of statements what does it actually mean um, how much caution? How do we measure caution when we say interpret with caution? Um, how do we measure validity when we are uh, sharing, you know, validity statements? Um, do I believe it's an accurate assessment of the child's skills? How do I measure that? You know, I, I, I think we have to be cautious about throwing those terms around. Um, and so when we're painting a picture of the child in our report, what does that mean? What does it look like? I think it's important for us to ask those questions. And the more we talk about it, hopefully the more prepared we are um, 
to write reports that are reflective of the of the child's skills and needs. Yeah, and I have started thinking about, you know, when we're you know, saying things like interpret with caution and whatnot, I, I start to think about, you know, does this testing answer my referral question or is this at least useful in the referral question? And if it's not, if the kid, you know, couldn't sit for the exam because the attention was so bad and so, you know, we needed a cognitive score, but we couldn't really get one because, you know, there was all these confounding things, um, you know, is that piece of information useful for her, for for the purpose of, of my referral question? And so, like, I feel like that's kind of what it comes down to. And there's certainly levels of, of usefulness. And um, as far as, you know, it may be, you know, it, it is a lower estimate of what they're capable of doing, but we're still confident that, you know, our, our question of whether or not their ID or not has been answered through that. Um, either they're, you know, they're far too high or they're they're very low or, you know, um, you know, so that's kind of what I've been trying to think of, you know, how how well am I answering that question with, with this particular score and measure. Yeah, I and I would encourage any of you out there that are graduate students and, and like really trying to just figure this out to um, ask you know, the questions that you feel like are too embarrassing to ask, because um, you will find, I think, that a lot of people have those same questions. And so it, when I was Googling today, psychological, psychoeducational evaluation report writing, I found a lot of um, school psychologists talking about this, including people on YouTube and and one that got a lot of comments and a, a lot of views and likes was just basic, like she was saying, here's how I structure my report, right? And so we do talk about that, I know, in, in at least in, in the clinical um, class, uh, cognitive uh, assessment class that I just took. We talk about that, but it seems as though like we need to talk about that more when you're starting out. Like it's not enough to just have these headings and these like catchphrases if you really don't know what why they're important and what they mean. Down to like the um, the beginning where you're talking about things like rapport was easily established and the child is of average height and uh, it, it was dressed appropriately. Like why would you even say that if you don't know why it's important, right? Like don't, don't say anything or write anything that you don't know why it matters just because you saw it in someone else's report. Um, and then ask the questions. Ask, I think we can ask our professors. And I found that I had that, <laughs> thanks Sue, uh, I had that experience because going into a, a, a class as a school psychologist, I felt like, oh my gosh, if I ask this question, they're going to know that I don't know anything. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like certified, I'm nationally certified. I should know this, but I just had to get over that because ask your questions. That's what you're paying for in graduate school. And as an early career person too, you if, if you don't know, there's so many people that can help. And um, one of the benefits of having a professional learning community like this and being connected to School Psych Podcast is you can me message us, ask on our Facebook and our social media and even in messages if you want, because these conversations are helpful, I think, to all of us. So that's, yeah, so I'm going to step down now from my soapbox. <laughs> I, I like that. You know, I've never read in a report anybody say, you know, the child was disheveled and dirty. They always say, you know, the child was well groomed, or you know, um, you, you know what I mean. And and so I guess my question would be: if you're going to describe how the child looks, are you able to do that um, objectively? What's the checklist that says, you know, um, you know, clothing? Describe clothing. Describe hair. Describe haircut. Describe, you know. Um, and, you know, are we inspecting fingernails, um, you know, all of that. So I think we we, we should be cautious about that. Um, and obviously, if you can be objective, if a child has um, a significant weight issue, you know, I, I would assume that a doctor would, you know, identify that because it's a concern, right? If Or if a child had an endocrine issue and was unusually tall, you know, beyond the, the norm or something, um, you know, that would 
be noted. And so would we note that in our report? But for average, you know, that's a hard one. And and something Charles Barrett said that really struck me a couple of weeks ago at his workshop was um, we throw around that term average a lot. And in our circles, it means normal, right? Right in the middle, right where they should be in the center of that bell curve at the 50th percentile. But nobody wants to hear that their child is average, right? In the real world, when we hear average, it means boring or um, unexciting or not uh, above the crowd. Um, and so what are some descriptive terms that we could use that would describe the child and their performance without perhaps using terms that might make parents, you know, cringe or or make them frustrated or something. And so he talked about how he chooses his words carefully um, in his reports and in his meetings. And perhaps you can say, you know, uh, right where they should be, you know, um, consistent with their peers, those kinds of things. Um, and so just being cautious about terms that perhaps get misinterpreted. Um, I think that was his uh, his point to us. All good points. Go ahead, Rebecca. <laughs> I just I put it in the comments above, but I also wanted to refer you all to um, episode seventy nine on report writing with uh, Dr. Jeanan Carrier if I'm pronouncing her name close to correctly, I hope. Um, that was a good episode. And she has that wonderful book with a colleague about report writing. So look at that. There's lots of ways to take a deeper dive in this area, but just know we're with you. I mean, you know, I, I'm mid-career and I have the same questions that <laughs> you do. Um, so don't feel bad about them. They're great questions. I think that we all really should think about what we're doing and why we're doing it and, and if we can improve. Yeah, we had um, Dr. Joel Schneider come on too as well, who did some on uh, report writing. And he's just like a whole level of, of how he describes things, if I recall. So that might be a good one. You know, I've been kind of on a little bit of a journey um, the past couple of years in my district with trying to reimagine um, how we might change a little bit for learning disability evaluation. So, you know, uh, coming from a district that's uh, PSW, yeah, the psychs would give the cognitive, the special educators would give the achievement testing, and we come together and look at the scores and yes or no LD based on that. And um, so uh, with all the research that's come out I, with PSW being no better than any other model that it's not, you know, more effective at identifying SLD. And certainly the interventions that seem to come from those cognitive measures haven't really panned out in the research as being super effective. Um, and that episode with Matt Burns, um, early episode on skill by treatment interaction and, and all that I think is, is really helpful. So I've had all that in my mind and was kind of given the go ahead to, to dive into some of the research a little bit by my boss. And we had some summer committees and um, looking at different, you know, looking at our practices, looking at our numbers and how, you know, do we have anything that's predictive of SLD identification? Turns out that all our cognitive scores, nothing correlated to predicting whether or not a child was going to qualify. Um, we looked at achievement scores and shockingly, um, there was only two or three areas of achievement that seemed to predict, um, you know, whether or not a child was going to qualify. I thought that there would be more um, areas. And so we've been I've been uh, through the years coming to terms with the fact that we're not good as a field at uh, figuring out what SLD is and isn't. But I think that we all can agree, you know, what kids need and we need these evidence-based practices and whatnot. So I've kind of almost given up the fight of, I mean, we need to figure out a way to identify SLD or not. Um, but I think more important is what does this kid need, whether that ends up being in general education or in special education. So um, in researching some of the models and, and how we can write reports better to inform um, and, and really, I, I think not to, again, like not too many people actually read the psych report. And I think that the thing that's more impactful for kids is the IEP. I'm like, I want to get into the IEP. I want to inform the present levels. I want to work with the special educator to make sure that the goal is appropriate, that the instruction is appropriate, that we're measuring things. Like that to me makes a much bigger difference in the life of the child. Of are they working on the right thing? 
rather than you know all the recommendations that I can put in a psych report that most people don't even pay too close attention to. Um, so you know, looking at, at writing reports that can translate into IEPs has been kind of something that I'm um, working on more. And again, that's a work in progress. But in looking at these different models, um, you know, we had Dr. Dombrowski come on um, and talk. Um, I'm not even sure. I, I think what did he talk on? I can't really remember. But he was might have been identified. Might have been SLD. Um, I'll have to go back and look, but he was great. And he has an SLD model and it's a low achievement model, meaning kind of like um, DSM, you know, you have to, you're performing low compared to peers and, you know, maybe you've tried some interventions and that hasn't worked. And so bam, SLD, like let's not make it more complicated than it needs to be. If at the end of the day, all these complicated models aren't any more effective at identifying it. Um, so we were kind of doing a little bit of a pilot and working through that. And so I'm working with a bunch of awesome school psychologists to pilot how, how this would look a little bit, just some little tweaks at this point um, and kind of doing two models concurrently, but seeing how, you know, if there's differences in qualification, if we're going to look at the data through this different lens and you know, how might um, a report look differently? Because his model, it requires that normative uh, deficit. So that would be your WJ, your Wyatt, your whatever. And in my case, that's the special education teachers doing that report and finding out that, yes, they're, they're below average, um, which is a big part of SLD. Um, the second requirement is kind of there's this functional impairment. So it's not just there's a normative de deficit compared to the country, but within the classroom, they're compared to their peers, they're not able to access the curriculum. Like, what does this look like functionally in there? Um, and so I think that's important too, because we talked about, you know, it could be the curriculum, it could be, I mean, there's so many other things that cause low achievement that aren't due to disabilities. It could be the kid is absent all the time. It could be that the classroom is a mess, uh, you know, behaviorally, there's so much going on. There's, I mean, there's a million different reasons that a kid is going to struggle. And so it's not always again, within the child, there's a lot of environmental stuff. So, you know, that normative achievement deficit, that functional impairment. Um, and then the third kind of criteria is those exclusionary factors. You know, it's not due to ID or ED. And really, even more so than exclusionary factors, I feel like impacting factors, again, bringing in those other, you know, reasons. And I think that identifying those reasons and saying this curriculum isn't a good fit and, and you know, this is going on here, those are important conversations to have because we can maybe impact some change on there too. And I think that it's a hard conversation sometimes to have that, you know, look, this classroom, the behavior management, it's really difficult right now. And that's a hard conversation to have, but I feel like we need to start having those conversations. So I'm really excited about that. But through that model, I'm, I'm looking more at CBM, um, finding again, those those deficits. And so, you know, okay, they're struggling to read. Uh, oftentimes we get, okay, it's reading comprehension. Well, then when we look at some things, we do a reading fluency probe, like, oh, their fluency is really low. Oh, let's look further. Oh, they're phonics. Like they're, they're reading 50% of the words. Like what is phonemic aware? And looking at all those, um, different things. And Dr. Vander Hayden has been great about math and I'm learning so much about math. And we have Dr. Harris and she's going to be coming back on to talk about writing, but looking at what is good instruction and um, weaving that into reports. And I feel like that's a complicated thing for school psychologists, um, depending on your training, you know, if we've been exposed to all that. But, you know, when you're talking about starting as a, as a school psychologist and those kind of fill in the blank scenarios, it's a long way off from there because it takes, it takes a lot to get there. And I'm, again, learning as I'm going, but I feel like at the end of the day that my reports are, are getting stronger and are getting um, more specific and I'm able to give more specific recommendations that leads to more specific goals that, you know, um, that whole thing. So that's been kind of a fun journey um, on my end. And I'm hoping that maybe it'll pan out and we'll be able to switch up our model for everybody. But um, I don't know, we're still a little bit <laughs> away from that. But so that's been on my mind lately. I love that. Um, I, I wish we all had a chance to or could get a chance to participate in, in studying like that, understanding you know, how our state's interpreting the construct of SLD and how we're identifying it. And um, it, I think most people and most states uh, associations agree that the construct of SLD is really poorly defined. 
and the way to identify it is poorly um, constructed. So yeah, the more we get to talk about this and try to perfect the process, uh, the better off our students will be. And focusing on the the goals, right? I, I love that, Rachel, to uh, have our report inform the IEP, right? And leading to accurate goals. And yeah, and I've asked teachers, like, how how often have you taken my cognitive data and written a goal from that? Like, how, how does that right. help you? I mean, they seem to think that it helps them, but when you don't write goals on cognitive skills, they might throw some accommodations in there. But again, those aren't research based, like it's just kind of a mess. And a part of this model too, um, so it doesn't rely on the cognitive. So we are requiring a cognitive screener. So I've been giving like the wrist um, or the KBIT or, or something, you know, for the purpose of ruling out ID, you know, as part of that exclusionary factor, but not relying on that um, anymore as like the entryway into I just feel like we're so busy. Let's not do things that aren't useful. <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, I posted uh, just Dr. Dombrowski's episode was number 104 for anyone. Uh, and it was on learning disabilities. And it looks like uh, probably right at the beginning of COVID, I think we had him on May or June of 2020. So we were all just getting into <laughs> the impact of COVID at that point. That's probably why I don't remember. My head was somewhere else. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, it makes me think of like how much of a good resource we have in back episodes and past episodes. And um, every now and then, I, I don't like to hear my own voice. Maybe some of you have that also, but so I don't listen <laughs> to our podcast that often. But sometimes when I, I have something specific on my mind, I do go back and listen to some of our guests and it's helpful. So I hope um, you all out there will use past episodes as a resource and let us know what you think and um, how you're interacting with the content. And if you have any thoughts or questions, even questions for our guests, because usually everyone is so wonderful and willing to um, take our questions even uh, later in time. So let us know if you go back and watch any of those episodes and, and you have um, anything to share from, from your own experience. That would be awesome. All right. I don't know if we want to wrap. Any last questions? Feel free to post. And what is our, what is our next topic? I don't even know we need to look. <laughs> Let's see. I don't remember offhand either. We have... The holidays and the holidays. New Year's <laughs> to get through. <laughs> um, and then um, after that. 115, we've got um, Dr. Behrens. I'm not sure if I'm saying her um, name right, but she is uh, behavioral in nature. And um, I caught her on another podcast where she was kind of posing some really strong and good questions about um, neuropsychological assessments. And um, some of the things that I've referenced about, you know, we're not hooking kids up to MRIs, they were behavioral um, measures, assuming that we're measuring, you know, neuro kind of constructs and things like that. So she talks about some of that type of stuff as far as um, making sure that we're not making assumptions off of neuropsychological testing that is maybe not realistic. So I thought it was a good listen. So we asked her to come on. Yeah, and I just wanted to um, share that in March, we're having Dr. Ray Krishner on, and um, he reached out to us. He has a really cool new podcast that I want to plug for him uh, because I've been listening. It's called Psych to Practice Podcast, and his goal, along with a colleague, is to connect uh, academia to clinicians, and it's really cool stuff. We're going to probably go on his podcast and he's going to come on to ours in March. So look for that, but another way to connect what we're learning and some of us are teaching in school to what we do in schools and with kids. So that's going to be good stuff coming up. Awesome. And uh, today I believe is the first day of Hanukkah. So happy mm -hmm. Hanukkah to all who celebrate and um, Merry Christmas and happy new year coming up and happy Kwanzaa and uh, we just hope that everyone's holidays are filled with love and family and friends and that you get a chance to relax, 
catch and don't write it. Don't write any reports. Don't write any reports. Not allowed. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, this podcast told you not to. That's right. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, everybody. We'll uh, catch up in the new year, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone.